I went through every chart type I can imagine, from really basic to extremely complicated. And I picked out the charts that I think everyone should know and understand. I've rated each chart across two dimensions, coolness, or how interesting it is visually, and usefulness, or how likely you are to actually use it at work. I'll explain exactly when to use each one, and maybe more importantly, when not to use them. Plus, I'll throw in a bunch of really practical tips so you can easily design charts that tell a clear and compelling story every single time. I've also included timestamps down below for each chart type so you can save this video and then come back to it whenever you need help with a particular chart. By the way, for those that don't know me, my name is Paul and I'm an instructor at Analyst Academy. We teach a range of presentation and data visualization skills to people and teams all around the world. So if you're interested in learning more, check out our trainings over at theanalystacademy.com. All right, let's start with a basic bar chart and its cousin, the column chart or vertical bar chart. Now, both of these are great for comparing categories against each other, and that's because you can easily compare the lengths of the bars without having to worry about any other dimensions. So if you wanted to show some kind of ranking, for example, a bar chart would be perfect because even if the bars are close, it's clear which one's longer. Bar and column charts can be incredibly useful, but here's a few tips. Number one, make sure you order the categories logically. If it's a ranking, put them in order from largest to smallest. Horizontal bar charts actually work great for this because we naturally associate ranking from top to bottom. And then likewise, if you're comparing information over time, use a column chart because we associate time as moving from left to right. Next, where possible, put the labels at the end of your bars. It just makes it easier to read instead of having to measure against the axis. And while you're at it, remove the grid lines from your chart. There are some cases where they're useful, but usually you just don't need them. Then lastly, keep the colors of your bars simple. Best practice is to have them all the same color except for the bars that you're trying to focus on. For bar and column charts, you also have different variations like clustered, stacked, and 100% stacked. A cluster chart allows you to compare the subcategories against each other. Like in this example where instead of comparing the regions against each other, it compares the years for each region. There's also a stacked bar chart which puts a focus on the total of subcategories instead. This is just like a normal bar chart, except you can also see the breakdown of subcategories. Like in this example, where it shows the total value of private funding by year, while still being able to see the breakdown for each year. For this one, you have to be careful that you're not trying to tell a story about the breakdown. The focus is on the total of each column because that's what's easiest to see. And lastly, you have 100% stacked, which only compares the breakdown and doesn't even show the total. I usually see these for survey results in a bar chart where you can clearly see the breakdown for each question and even rank them when you need to. Or in the case of a column chart, these types of charts can be good for showing change over time. You can almost think of them like pie charts stacked vertically next to each other. Next, we have a line chart, which is just like a column chart, except it puts an emphasis on change over time. While a column chart focuses on each individual period or category, a line chart connects all that data together. So it's great for showing overall trends or patterns or sometimes exceptions in the data. Like in this example where you can see a very clear drop in supplier times. Another use case is when you're comparing the patterns of categories against each other, like in this example showing how spending patterns differ between Gen Z, Millennials, and Gen X. You can improve your line charts by using easy to read colors, putting labels right next to your lines instead of in a legend, and calling out important sections of your chart, like a significant time period or event that's relevant to the data. You also commonly see these in combination charts where you have both a line chart and a column chart in the same space. These can be good for when you're trying to show two types of data that are relevant to each other, but just be careful to make sure everything's clear and that the relationship isn't too complicated. These charts are also useful and uncool, but stay with me because it's about to get more interesting. So you might have noticed that I'm showing you when to use these charts, but not necessarily how to create them. For that, I recommend a tool called Ampler Charts, which is a super simple but powerful tool that plugs right into PowerPoint and makes chart building incredibly easy. Instead of having to use PowerPoint's native chart building features, which to be honest, are terrible, you can make most major chart types in just a few clicks. Making changes to the chart is quick and intuitive, and it's easy to add different things like callouts and legends and reference lines. That's because instead of catering to a wide range of audiences, they focus on adding features that get used in PowerPoint heavy careers like consulting or finance. They also have a suite of other tools like a PowerPoint add-in that supercharges your slide building that I use all the time. They've got one for Excel, 
Outlook, and even Word. And these are all designed just to make you really good at your job. I've been using and recommending Ampler for a long time, and they're actually a partner of ours. So anyone who enrolls in our data visualization course gets six months of Ampler charts for free. But if you just want to try it out, I'll put a link in the description for a free one-month trial. There's no credit card required, and sign up's pretty simple. So make sure you check it out. The next chart is an area chart, which you can almost think of like a line chart and a column chart combined. It shows the overall trend of the data, but still emphasizes the actual volume of the data. So these can be good for quantities, like if you're trying to show change in revenue over time, for example. But where these really shine is with multiple categories, like in a stacked or a 100% stacked area chart, because you can see how the makeup of categories changes over time. The focus is still on the overall trend, but unlike a line chart, I can stack these on top of each other. So it's easy to see how each contributes to the overall total. Then with a 100% stacked area chart, the focus is entirely on how the makeup of categories changes over time, which is why these charts can be useful for emphasizing change. For area charts, the key is to avoid using too many categories. You also wanna make sure the message you're emphasizing is crystal clear. If you're trying to compare the categories against each other at specific periods, you're usually better off using a stacked column chart instead. Area charts tend to look a little more interesting and they can be really useful, but you gotta be careful because they can easily be misused. The next is a pie chart, which is good for comparing one or more categories against each other. Pie charts get a ton of hate, but if you use them correctly, they can actually be very useful. What you wanna avoid is comparing the categories directly against each other. In this example, each of the pie charts are used to show the portion one category makes up of the total. But then for comparison, they've stuck with a column chart because the lengths of the bars are easier to compare than slices of a pie would be to compare. A variation on the pie chart is a donut chart, which is basically the same thing, but without the center. And these are good if you wanna put something in the middle, like a title or a number but otherwise the charts are mostly interchangeable. For pie charts, avoid comparing multiple pie charts against each other. Try to also minimize the number of categories. Two or three is usually best and use minimal colors as well because it's best if you can emphasize the category you're focusing while keeping the other ones sort of muted. Putting these on the bottom left just because they get misused so often and I wouldn't exactly call them cool either. All right, now let's talk about scatter plots, which is just a collection of dots, each plotted according to a set of X and Y coordinates. And these are best for showing the relationship between two variables like height and weight. For example, here this chart shows the relationship between profitability and inventory. According to the chart, industries that turn inventory quickly tend to also have lower margins. So a scatter plot can be good for showing a positive relationship between the variables, a negative relationship, or even sometimes no relationship at all. They're also great for showing where one or more data points compares against the others. Like in this example, they're not showing any sort of relationship, but they are trying to show where Ford F-150 compares to the other trucks. You can generally improve your scatter plots by adding information to explain the relationship, such as a grid or some other kind of callout. You can also add in additional variables to your data, such as by varying the size of the dots to make it a bubble chart, or adding color or changing the shapes of your data points. Lots of options here. But you need to be very careful when you do this because it can easily complicate your message. So in my experience, usually the simplest version of a scatter plot is best. Scatter plots are both useful and cool, but with bubble charts, you have to be a lot more careful. Another great chart to use is a waterfall chart. And I see this one used in a professional setting all the time. A waterfall chart is like a column chart, except with its subcategories separated out into different smaller columns. So generally there's two reasons to use a waterfall chart. The first is to show how to get from one value to another. The other reason is to show the breakdown of a single value, like here where you can see different sources of capital investment for offshore wind projects. You can make your waterfall charts easier to read by including data labels with your floating columns and also adding groupings or callouts where possible. And as with other charts, you really wanna be careful about how you use color here. For example, you might wanna use red for negative columns, green for positive columns, and neutral for total columns. A waterfall chart is one of my favorites because it's both practical and interesting, so I'm putting it up here. This next chart looks complicated but can actually be incredibly useful, and that's the MECO chart. You can think of a MECO chart like a 100% stacked column chart but with an additional dimension, width. This allows you to rank along one dimension while still showing another. Basically, it can help you answer multiple questions with a single visualization. For example, here you can see investment flows in Malaysia. The width shows the size of investments by type, and then the height breaks it down by focus areas like solar and food waste. This makes it easy to compare both the biggest investors and where they're putting their money. 
My main advice for Meco charts is to make sure they're easy to understand. Clearly label what your axes mean and make sure you use colors and outlines to make the different subcategories distinct and easy to read. These are definitely cool looking, but they can be confusing for audiences, so they're not always useful. A very similar looking chart is the tree map chart. Now, at first glance, you might think that these are the same chart, but they're not. They're both great for showing the proportion a category makes up of the total, but where they're different is that tree maps can have multiple nested categories, and they also don't follow the same sort of rigid dimensions of a macro chart. Here, every box is the right proportion to the total, but they all have varying widths and lengths. So just like with a pie chart, you don't want to use tree maps when you're comparing the different categories or subcategories against each other. Instead, it should be when you're showing how one category fits into the overall total. Like here, where you're trying to emphasize the services companies procure that require more active governance, like professional services and IT, and the overall portion they make up of the total. If I were comparing these directly against each other, I'd be better off with a bar chart because that would help me compare the lengths of the bars easily. A good tip with these is to make sure you use color intentionally. So for example, you could use color to separate different groupings of categories. Another useful approach is to use size to show one dimension and color to represent something else. So like in this example, it's a visualization of the stock market. The size represents trading volume for each stock, while the color is used to show a change in value. And charts like this can be really powerful because at a glance, the amount of red or green gives you a good indication for the overall direction and impact of change in the market. But above all else, you want to make sure that the message you're trying to communicate is obvious. A tree map with a bunch of categories that are all the same size and no clear message is usually not that helpful. Which is why these have average usefulness, but are still pretty cool. Another commonly used chart is a heat map, which just helps measure data intensity. So you can imagine it like a regular table, except with color to show the high and low values or whatever sort of meaning you want to represent visually. Like in this example that shows retail broken down by category with a color spectrum to indicate year over year change. Or this example that shows AI adoption by industry and by function. The major benefit to these is that they can take a very large data set and turn it into something that's both visual and pretty intuitive. So just make sure you clearly label what your colors mean and avoid overwhelming the viewer with too many variables. The trick is to really think about the message you're trying to communicate. Heat maps are good for getting a good visual overview, but if you're trying to communicate something more specifically, often that message can come across more clearly in a bar chart, a line chart, or even in a table. Notwithstanding, this is a great chart that can still be fairly useful and is definitely really cool. Earlier, I shared some of the basic bar chart variations like clustered and stacked, but there's also some slightly more advanced variations that can be really useful. The first is a range bar chart, where the bars don't all start in the same place. Just like it sounds, these types of charts can be good for showing a range of different values. Where I've seen this used before is in finance where they're trying to show different valuations for a company. Sometimes they call this a football field. Here, instead of comparing absolute values against each other, you're comparing the ranges of the different methods. So you can get a sense for what a reasonable valuation would be. There's also a diverging bar chart which shows values for two separate variables that extend out from the middle. And these are good for exploring the relationship between variables across different categories. So like in this example that shows how a reduction in CO2 emissions would impact both society and industry for various categories like automotive and logistics. A slight variation on this is the tornado chart, which is great for when you're doing a sensitivity analysis. In other words, you want to see the impact certain changes would have on different categories. In this example, it shows how a 20% cost increase or 20% decrease would impact different categories like staff and overhead. Then finally, you have a butterfly chart, also known as a population chart. These are basically the same idea as a diverging bar chart, except the data is often sort of symmetrical. And instead of comparing individual bars, the insight comes from looking at the overall trend. With each of these charts, they can be useful in specific situations, but it's only cool when you get it right. For these next few charts, I'm gonna go pretty quickly in sort of a lightning round. First, we have a Gantt chart, which is super boring, but also pretty common. Usually it's good for visualizing project timelines and showing milestones, things like that. A related chart is a bullet chart, which helps show progress towards a goal of some kind. I don't think bullet charts are really that useful at all, whereas Gantt charts can be really useful. But make no mistake, both of these charts are very uncool. Then you've got a handful of statistical charts that are slightly more complicated, but in the right setting can be pretty powerful. 
A histogram is a chart that shows frequency distribution. It looks like a column chart, but the difference is it shows the number of occurrences of a certain category, and those categories are continuous. So one category ends where the next one begins. Then you've got a dot plot, which is like a scatter plot, but with discrete categories. The benefit of these charts is that you just focus on one dimension, so they're pretty easy to understand. A similar looking chart is the candlestick chart, which usually shows how stock prices move during a given period. The thick part, or the body, shows the opening and closing prices, and then the thin lines, the wicks, show the highest and lowest prices. Red means it went up, green means it went down. Then there's a Pareto chart, which is slightly more advanced, but I think can actually be pretty useful. It's a bar chart that also shows how much each bar contributes to the total. So like in this example, that shows the reasons why someone shows up late for work. The bars represent the number of people that gave that reason, and the line shows the cumulative percentage. I guess in some ways you could think of it kind of like simultaneously providing the benefits of a bar chart and also a pie chart. Speaking of which, there's also a waffle chart, which is basically like a pie chart, slightly more fun to look at. It could also be easier to compare. So like a stacked column chart, sort of mixed with a pie chart. Of these charts, I definitely see the Pareto and candlestick charts used the most. And I actually think they're both pretty interesting. This last group of charts are charts that are generally interesting to look at, but aren't necessarily practical for everyday use. The first is a Sankey diagram, which is useful for showing the flow of things, like in this example that shows the revenue breakdown for Spotify. However, I've never actually seen these used in a real presentation. If you're actually trying to communicate a clear message, usually you're better off showing the same data in a stacked bar chart or a waterfall chart. Next is a sunburst chart, which is kind of like a pie chart, but with multiple layers of category breakdowns. They're interesting, but not always intuitive, which is why I usually prefer a treetop chart, which is basically the same thing, just not circular. A ribbon chart is sort of like a stacked column chart, but with categories that are resorted in each column. Like here, where the yellow category moves from the second spot down to the fifth, then back up to the third. It's a really interesting idea, actually, but it's just too easy to misuse this chart, mainly because too many categories can make it kind of complicated. And also visually, it's not always an accurate depiction of the data. So in most cases, you're usually better off sticking with a stacked bar chart or a line chart. A chord diagram is similar to a Sankey diagram in that it visualizes flows. So it's used for showing relationships between different things. However, usually the visualization is way too complicated and hard to understand. So again, it's a cool idea, but not at all practical unless you're highlighting just one or two specific flows. And even then, it's kind of hard to follow. Then lastly, we have a radar chart, which I actually see used quite a bit. I've used it before. It's a simple chart that plots the data points on a set of axes all coming from a central location. So the data points are then connected together, which makes it look like a radar or a spider web. These are also called spider charts. When the message is obvious, these charts can generally be useful, but there's a few challenges. One of them being the order of the categories can change the shape and the volume of your web. Another one is that the categories themselves are all weighted equally when that may not be the case. You might have sales, costs, profit, assets, and employee satisfaction all on the same chart, but those shouldn't be measured against each other. Instead, use a clustered column chart or even a line chart. So now we've got all our charts ranked into this nice scatter plot. And I split it out into four quadrants. All stars, which are both useful and cool, show-offs, which are cool but not useful, workhorses, which are useful but not cool, and then forgettables. Not cool, not useful. Let's we'll start with the forgettables. Here you've got charts like pie charts, dot charts, and bullet charts. In general, these charts are not useful and not that cool. Avoid these at all costs. Then we've got our workhorses. Here we've got charts like bar charts, line charts, and column charts and different variations. You can almost never go wrong with these. Then there's the show-offs. Sankey diagrams, ribbon charts, sunburst charts, and this might be controversial, but bubble charts, all show-offs. Then lastly, we have the all-stars. These are useful and they look cool. Waterfall charts, mecho charts, heat maps, and of course, scatter plots. All right, that's gonna do it for today's video. Let me know down in the comments what you thought or if there's any charts that you think that I missed. And if you're interested in a one month free trial of Ampler Charts, I'll include a link in the description where you can check that out. And of course, if you're interested in our courses and live trainings, you can find more information about that at theanalystacademy.com. Thanks for watching.